My name is Lippy. I am a science engagement engineer um, at NERSC. And um, actually, one of my jobs is trying to make this whole process for new users of, of onboarding at NERSC a little bit easier, faster, more efficient. Um, so I'm really interested in your feedback. Um, that said, this is the first time I have actually presented during our new user training. So um, again, I, I really look forward to all your feedback. So during this session, we're going to talk about, okay, you've heard a lot about what is NERSC, um, some of our resources and features, um, you know, how do you get an account? How do you use your account? Um, but really what we need to talk about is how do you actually connect to NERSC and start using Perlmutter, which is our current um, system. Um, but first, I do have a sort of uh, question for you. Um, how many of you have seen this movie, the Martian. Um, it's got Matt Damon in it. He's working for NASA and he gets stuck on Mars. Have people seen this movie? Okay, I see one hand. Throw your hands up in your Zoom hand up if you've seen this movie. Okay, amazing. For the record, I really love this movie. Absolutely love it. You may recall this fantastic scene where Donald Glover um, is this brilliant uh, scientist and he's the one calculating how to get Matt Damon back home. And um, he goes to NASA and plugs his computer in with some random cable to a server rack. And um, I thought this was amazing and hilarious when I saw this. Um, another fantastic thing that happens at the end is that he gets this great thing that says his calculations are correct, which I really wish my, um, you know, scientific calculations did this kind of thing too. At the end, they would tell me that I was correct. Um, unfortunately, in general, neither of these things are true. In particular, um, you do not need to physically go into the server room and plug your laptop into one of our servers in order to do your calculations. So this is what not to do. So when you're thinking about connecting to NERSC, um, you do not need to think about physically going anywhere and plugging your laptop in. And this won't make anything faster. And in fact, it probably will um, make it so you can't use our system anymore if you tried to do this. So what we're gonna talk about is how it's way easier to connect to NERSC than that. Really all you do need is an internet connection. Um, you need a laptop or a computer with something called a terminal, which we're gonna talk about, and you will need your username, password, and multi-factor authentication method. Um, Clayton just went through this. So when I get to those slides, I'm gonna zip through them really quickly, um, but they will be there um, in, in our slides so you can come back to them if you need to. So our agenda today is to go through IRIS. Um, again, um, Clayton did just talk about how to navigate IRIS and set up your MFA. So I'm going to zip through those. Um, but then we're going to talk about how to actually connect to Perlmutter. Again, not going into the server room and plugging your laptop in, but connecting through SSH. Um, there's also a really good method in using our Jupyter Hub. Um, so if you're familiar with Jupyter, it, we have a really thriving Jupyter community. I usually use Jupyter um, a lot because it saves me the hassle of uh, typing in my password <laughs> um, because I can just have it saved in my uh, browser. And then um, we're also going to talk about No Machine, which is a really good way for uh, using GUI-based applications on NERSC systems. So for example, if you're a MATLAB user, um, <clears throat> that's one of the only GUI-based ones I'm familiar with, but I know there are others that are supported through No Machine. Um, so that's a, a good way to do that. Um, we are gonna talk about submitting user tickets. Um, Helen did touch on this. Again, you'll notice that we kind of bring things up multiple times because we want it to be really clear that these are the best ways to um, get help. We're also going to talk about navigating the documentation. So this is our um, technical, basically, like manual of how to use our system. And we're also going to talk a little bit about um, our homepage, which has some good information. OK, so um, we're going to talk about Iris. What is Iris? Um, Clayton did mention this. Um, I like to use analogies uh, because that's how I remember things. Um, so I, I sort of think you could sort of think of uh, Iris as being almost like the lab notebook for the nurse computing resources. Um, if you think about when you're doing your science, you might have some apparatus that you're using, but then you have some place where you're like keeping track of things. And so that's what Iris is. It's sort of keeping track of the 
other stuff that you're doing. Um, not the same way as, I guess, exactly a lab notebook, because it's not a space where you can go and like take notes necessarily about stuff, but it's a good place to go and get information about nurse usage. Um, so for example, that's where you would go if you have any password issues or you need to set up your multi-factor authentication. Um, it's also a place where you can check your compute hours or storage space. Um, and then PIs also have the ability to um, add new users um, into their uh, projects. <clears throat> you can also check uh, information about the jobs that you've been running and the hours that you've been charging. Um, so there's a lot of information in IRIS. Um, as Clayton showed, this is, um, you just go to iris.nurse.gov. If you have any trouble with logging in, you forgot your password, this is a great place to go because it has a forgot password button. Um, otherwise, you would just log in. Um, again, I'm, I'm zipping through this because Clayton just showed this and I don't want to take too much time. But in case you missed what Clayton was showing, um, you'll be presented with this um, federated ID. You can um, select uh, your your institution and then log in from there. So you'll get you'll be asked your username and password. Um, and then the first time, again, you won't have your MFA set up, so you'll be able to log in. Um, in order to set up your MFA. Um, I, as, as mentioned uh, by many people, it's just a really good way to make sure that we're keeping our, our resource really secure. <clears throat> Excuse me. So <clears throat> you will need to do this. Um, this is a news article, I guess, probably from, well, it's from 2020, actually. Um, where some supercomputers were getting hacked um, and being used inappropriately to mine cryptocurrency, we want to uh, completely uh, prevent anything from like that, from that, anything like this from happening. And so uh, MFA, while well, yes, it does add another layer when you're trying to log in, <clears throat> prevents us from having any security issues. So um, there's several several different ways you can get something that will tell you what this, you know, one-time password is. Um, that's what, what OTP, you'll see sometimes we say OTP means one-time password. Um, you can use Google Authenticator. Um, I think that's, that's pretty much what I use. Um, so there's different ways to do that. And then on your computer, there's also something called Authy. Um, so that will um, basically, there's a, it's a very, actually pretty easy setup process. You just use the QR code and then it will, keep refreshing and showing you that one-time password. Um, I, I actually don't have Authy on my computer. I just end up using my phone because I always have my phone near me. Uh, but if you have it on your computer, then you can just copy it, you know, control, copy, control, paste um, very easily. Um, again, if you're having trouble with any of this, you want to read it yourself, always feel free to go check out our documentation. Like I said, we're going to talk a little bit more about our documentation in a moment. Um, but feel free to go to docs.nurse.gov. That's our user manual, and you can see the information there. So um, you you did just see this briefly. Um, when you get into Iris and you're setting up your MFA, you'll go to the MFA tab um, at the top, and you'll click uh, Add Token button. There will be a QR code that you'll scan with your Authenticator app. Um, so again, if you have your phone, you just use your phone camera um, or uh, in Authy, you will basically paste a code, I think. And that will connect your NERSC account to your personal um, Authenticator app. And then you will be asked to use that one-time password anytime you're logging into uh, NERSC. To move my Zoom thing out of the way. Um, Great. Okay. So it'll, and, and it'll be six digits. Um, there's, I've seen some that are more than six digits. So luckily we just have six. <laughs> um, one thing to think about if you're in a situation where you're having trouble locking in, one thing that I often do as a consultant when someone is having trouble is I'll ask them, um, you know, did they set up their MFA? Maybe they forgot their password. Um, how, can they log into Iris? Because if you can log into Iris and not, uh, I forgot to remove Corey from here. Corey's gone. You can't log into Corey. Um, but if you if you can't log into Perlmutter, um, but you are able to log into Iris, that's just good information for us to have when we're trying to figure out what's happening. Um, sometimes what happens is that you um, haven't been re-add every year uh, during our financial year turnover. Um, 
users are removed from accounts and then they have to be added back in by their um, their PI, their principal investigator or um, PI proxy, someone who kind of acts in that role. So um, it's just good information for us to understand um, because, for example, if you're also struggling with Iris, okay, that's good information for us. Um, sometimes it's just internet issues. You know, there can be a lot of different things. So if you're having any trouble, um, you know, if you try logging into Iris and you're not able to do that, that's good information for us to have um, for uh, troubleshooting. Um, in general, there's a menu bar at the top that allows you to do different things. What I would recommend, honestly, is just logging in if you haven't and just clicking around and seeing what everything is. Um, so there'll be information about um, CPU and GPU access, um, storage details. This is where you can go and check how much like room you have in your like your quota. Um, this will give you information about the jobs you've run. So if you're um, curious about, um, you know, did that job actually run or how long did it run or something like that, this is a really good place to go look. Um, you can also do that directly on Perlmutter using some Slurm commands, which I think someone may talk about later. But if you're not familiar with that and you just want to look in Iris, this is a really good place to go look. Um, this will tell you about different Unix groups that you're in. Um, again, this is the MFA token setup. Um, and then this is information that, you know, like about who you are as a user um, uh, at Slack, or sorry, at, at NERSC. <laughs> Um, so one thing you can always do if you're using Iris and you're having any trouble, um, I have in the past helped people navigate Iris, uh, via tickets. So if you're in Iris and you're saying, Hey, I'm trying to find this information, I can't find it. Um, that's a totally valid reason to submit a ticket because, um, so there is information that maybe, you know, not all users are able to see, but we can get that information for you. So I have helped someone do that. Um, or we can just, you know, so sometimes it's hard to find things um, and we can help you just navigate Iris as well. Uh, it's one of those things where when you need to use it, you might have a reason to go and explore. And if you're having any trouble, you can always ask us. Um, this is specific to PIs and PI proxies. Um, so this is how uh, PIs can um, sort of check on their projects. So you'll click on um, so this is in roles, you'll click on pro like which project you want to look at, and that will give you specific information about the project, for example, how much um, time they have available, how much has been used, um, CFS is community file system, so this is like how much storage is available. Um, this is something that's allocated, um, so you need to... Um, there's, a, there's a process, and Clayton knows this better than me, but there's a process for if, they, if you need to... In, in, increase this amount, um, if that can be done or not. Um, so this is just a good place to go and check that information in this details tab here. Um, if, you, if you'd if you like to change your user shell, this is a more advanced um, topic if you're not familiar with what this is. Um, so your shell is basically how you interact with um, the NERSC like computer itself. And there's different options. Bash is usually the most common, but there are some advanced users who like to be able to change basically the, the language that they're using to talk to um, the, the to, to our system, to Perlmutter. Um, and you can do that um, here. I guess I don't know exactly which tab this is under though. Um, and I didn't check, but this is something you would do in Iris. So if you need to do this, um, you can uh, do this in Iris by clicking this edit button. Um, that said, I don't know what tab this is under, so I can go back and check, or maybe one of our um, consultants can um, put that in the Q&A doc. Um, but you don't need to interact with this. If you're very new and none of this makes sense to you, just don't worry about it because the, the default is going to be Bash. Um, I believe the default is Bash. Someone can correct me if that's not the case. Um, um, and that's going to be the standard way to uh, sort of interact with Perlmutter. So you probably won't need to change this unless you are an advanced user and have specific preferences. Cool. I can see there's stuff in chat, but I don't have it pulled up. Should I keep the chat open? Okay, yeah, default is bash. Good. Uh, 
Um, yeah, you can just oh, keep okay. going and we'll, we're answering the Q&A questions as well as in chat. Okay, sounds good. Great. Um, if there is anything that I should, you know, go back or to do, just feel free to ping me and I'll, I'll do that. Um, okay. Right. Okay. <clears throat> This la this bit is for adding users to an account. And again, Clayton, please correct me if I'm wrong, but this is something that only PIs and PI proxies can do. Um, um, so yeah, please, if you have a question, put it in the chat or in the in the Q&A, please. Um, oops, sorry. Um, and so this will be the way to, um, when you have a new um, user that, that's joining a project, um, but I believe they already have to have a NERSC account. Um, Clayton, please feel free to chime in here because I'm actually not totally sure. But they would have to have a NERSC account and their username already, and then the and then the PI or PI proxy would add them to the the project. There's a a link on that request there that allows them to invite a, a non NERSC user to right. join their project. Okay, yeah. perfect. Which does invite? Yeah. Yes, I see that right there. Great. Um, Good. So, uh, and and I've also seen tickets where people are, need to get in on a project, and um, we we do need the PI or PI proxy to uh, approve that request. So, um, nurse staff can also do it for a PI or a PI proxy if they're not able to do it for some reason. But you would need to um, basically, you know, CC them or in when you're at when you're submitting a ticket to nurse, there's a way to basically add someone to the ticket so that they can interact with it as well. Um, and so the best thing to do would be to make sure they're included in that. If for some reason they haven't been able to get around to it, um, then we can do that, but we need their permission to do that. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about how to actually connect to NERSC. Um, again, always remember as much as we love Donald Glover and well, and uh, Hollywood movies, you're not going to try to get into the server room and connect, you're gonna use the internet. Um, so one thing that you will need, again, reminder, not not this scene. <laughs> um, you will one of the one of the more traditional or um, uh, uh, commonly used methods is using um, SSH, uh, which stands for secure shell um, or secure socket shell or something. Um, but it's essentially using the internet. And um, so you will need an uh, internet connection and then you will need something called a text terminal program. So uh, if you're using a Mac, uh, there's terminal built in. You can just go to your applications and pull up terminal. Um, you can, sorry, um, you can download um, iTerm and I guess now there's iTerm 2. And this is just a, a nice terminal program uh, that offers a lot of cool features as well. And, and you can really customize it quite a bit. Whereas terminal, the basic one is, um, I mean, you can do some customization, but it's not as fancy. <laughs> um, on Windows, there's something called Putty. Um, and so we have the link here. And then I guess people also use something called MOBA Xterm. I have not used, I have used Putty. I haven't used um, any of these other Windows ones. Um, also haven't used a Windows computer in a long time. So, um, if you have specific questions about this, uh, feel free to put it in the Google Docs, um, or if you're struggling with any of these, please feel free to uh, submit a ticket. Um, Linux, I think there's probably a lot to, to choose from. Um, I, I think someone else made this slide, so which is great because I, I'm not really sure what the options are, but I'm sure there's a built-in for sure on Linux. Um, and then it sounds like with Chromebook, and I, I hadn't thought about this, but Chromebook has its own um, kind of uh, text terminal programs. Um, again, I, I'm not familiar with these. So uh, if you do have specific questions, um, definitely Google because using a terminal text terminal, just generally having one on any of these systems is like a very common thing. Um, so there might be information on Google, but if you're having specific questions or you're really struggling, you're always welcome to open a ticket because our consultants might be able to just help you out or parse some of that online information um, better if you're if you're struggling. Okay, so once you have your um, terminal, uh, again, you'll need your MFA configured already. So the first time you, when you don't have your MFA, you can go to Iris and you'll be able to log in and set it up. But if you're ready to actually connect to Perlmutter, 
um, you do need to have it set up already. And so what you're going to do once you open your terminal, and I have that on the next slide, you're going to type in these following commands. Um, I should have deleted this Corey thing here because Corey is um, not, unfortunately, not available anymore. Um, and actually, oh, these are updated. You don't need this P1. Oh, I didn't even notice that. I'm sorry. Um, so let me check here. Oh yeah, I forgot to update this. I saw this and I just didn't notice. So now you don't need to type this dash P1. You'll just type perlmutter.nurse.gov uh, or sol.nurse.gov. Um, and uh, so the first time you do this, you're gonna get this thing that says, um, you know, do you, do we want to recognize, you know, do we agree that this is the correct thing that you're trying to log into? Um, that's what this fingerprint is, and you can um, double check that it is the right fingerprint um, on, in our nurse documentation. The first time you do this, this is expected. Um, if that's something that you see again, um, please make sure to let us know um, because you shouldn't see it um, after you've done this one time. Um, Okay, now what you'll be asked to do, so now you say, yep, that's the right one. Um, that's what I'm trying to log into. Again, you don't need this P1 anymore. That was, yeah, that was phase one. Now you just type promoter.nurse.gov or sol.nurse.gov. And then you'll be asked to type in your password and one uh, one time password. So that's that OTP, that one time password that you get from your authenticator. And this is sometimes confusing to people because we have this, you know, space and then this plus sign in this space. Um, that's just a reminder that you need to have both of them, but you don't want any spaces or that plus sign when you type it in. So um, your username you've already told because you've put it up here before your SSH um, command. So let me go back. So you'll say SSH, your username at promutter.nurse.gov. So you've already told us your username. Now you're going to type in your password, whatever it is. And then without any spaces or the plus sign, you're going to type in the, the six digit um, one time password. When you're typing, it's very confusing. If you've never done this before, you won't see anything. So it's not like you'll see those little dots when you normally type in your password somewhere. Um, you won't see anything at all. Um, so it can be a little tricky um, to make sure that you're typing the right thing, um, but just have faith in yourself. Um, if it doesn't work the first time, I think it will actually let you try one more time. Um, I, and I don't remember how many times you can try. I don't think you get locked out. Um, you know, it's not like your phone where you, if you type your thing several times you get locked out, but I think at some point you, you will. Um, so maybe someone can clarify, but, but, because you won't see what you're typing, it can be difficult sometimes to know that you've typed the right thing. Um, so just try again if you're not able to. Um, always feel free to go and check in Iris, make sure that you're able to log in if you have any trouble with this, um, but hopefully not. Um, yeah, if you do see something, sometimes it just comes up with password and it won't say this plus OTP thing. Um, it probably means that you've either typed your password in wrong, because I've seen that happen to me, um, or your account isn't ready yet. Um, so either you just got it or um, you, you know, uh, someone has just re-added you or, you know, something along those lines. So just wait a little bit. Um, again, my tip to everybody, if they're having login troubles, is try to go log in on Iris and see if that helps. Okay, um, so you may have noticed here, Shazab, who made these slides uh, a long time ago, um, has included this minus capital Y. And this is um, actually to allow um, GUIs, um, it's called X forwarding. Um, you can, I guess you can do capital Y or capital X, and I don't remember what the difference is. So if someone wants to uh, enlighten me, feel free. Um, but this is what allows the X protocol to um, display any GUIs on your local machine, on your local monitor, because essentially SSH is allowing you to use a computer somewhere else. Um, but that computer doesn't have a monitor, but it might just be, you know, hosting that or, you know, running that GUI somewhere on that computer. So if you want to see it on your screen, you have to tell it, hey, you know, forward it using this protocol to my 
local monitor. And so that is done by adding this minus Y or minus X. If you're not running anything that's going to have any GUIs popping up or any plots or anything like that, you don't need this. Um, if you're not sure if you will, you can always do it and it doesn't slow anything down or change anything. It just makes that possible to, to happen in the first place. Um, that said, this can be very slow. Um, the process of having that GUI appear on your monitor, actually, um, we'll talk about this in a moment, but it can it can be slow and laggy. So we have some alternatives that you can use instead. Um, if you are regularly, you know, signing in and pulling up your terminal and doing some work and then you leave and you'll notice that, you know, your connection is not going to stay open for the whole day, um, there is a way to use something called SSH proxy, which creates basically like 24 hour access um, via this, you know, instead of having to type in your uh, one time password every single time. Um, it will kind of do it once for you. It'll keep the certificate and then allow you to use it for the next 24 hours before you have to do the password and one time password again. Um, and so in our documentation, you can look up, um, <clears throat> I guess you search MFA SSH, um, and it will come up with this SSH proxy. Um, our, our search function is very good and, and I use it all the time. So if for some reason you're not able to find it by typing MFA SSH, just type in SSH proxy. And that will walk you through the steps of um, how to set this up so that you don't have to do that constantly. But honestly, something that I also really like, you will have to enter your one-time password, but if you use Jupyter, you can have your password saved. You know, if you're using Vault or something like that, you can have it saved. And if you're using Authy, it's even easier because then your authenticator is on your computer. You can just copy paste it. Um, so if you want to access um, Promoter that way, that's also a good option. Now, Jupyter Hub is um, a very cool um, uh, sort of access point for NERSC because it's in your web browser. Um, what the first thing you'll be um, shown is this screen that gives you multiple options. And actually, I we maybe during the break, I know I'm already way over. Um, we'll, I can pull it up and show people if you're interested. There's basically going to be a bunch of different options. And there's a lot of explanation on that page. Once you sign in on Jupyter Hub, they'll show you a bunch of different options on how to connect. Um, and it's there's a lot of good explanation there. Um, but you can basically just start by using a shared CPU node, just kind of like a kind of like a login node um, and uh, start up your your server uh, on Promoter there. And then you'll basically be presented with almost like a, a GUI version of, of Promoter. So on the side, you'll see like a file browser. Um, you can, you know, click around. You can even like download things pretty easily using this. Um, it will probably be slow. So if you're doing a lot of downloading, don't do it, but you actually can do that. Um, you can click and drag stuff around. Um, and the other thing is there is a terminal here. So if you're doing a lot of stuff in terminal, you may want to just pull up an actual terminal. Um, but for me, like my workflow include a lot of like writing Python notebooks and making changes and then having a script and then wanting to run that script or submit that script to our, our scheduler. And so my, my terminal access was really minimal. And so I found this to be useful because I could do my Jupyter notebook, my IPython notebook work, um, and then submit my jobs. Um, you don't just have to do Python. There's a million, there's R, um, you can, you can write any script. I mean, you can just be work, you can write bash scripts. You can, you know, it's a text editor as well. Um, so there's a lot of options when you're using Jupyter, um, on how to use it. And we have a, a more training, um, on this later. Um, so if you are trying to use any, um, GPU or sorry, any GUI based, um, programs, um, what you'll probably need to do is use something called No Machine um, because it can be very slow to use uh, via terminal and this exporting, it basically will there be like a lot of lag. Um, so No Machine is a way to accelerate that, what's called that X protocol. 
Um, because what's happening is, so our network, our internal network, so this dotted line here represents um, like the internal network within NERSC. Um, it's extremely fast, but you're, and when I say extremely fast, I mean, we're talking probably a thousand times faster than your internet at home. Um, it, it can do this really well, but as soon as it kind of crosses the, the breach between NERSC and your internet, you'll find this is to be a huge bottleneck and things will be very laggy. So what no machine is doing is it's actually running this um, X server inside of NERSC and then just sending a small amount of data, which is just sort of like viewing it um, in on your on your monitor. So it speeds this up a lot. Um, so I'm not going to talk about this too much, but there is um, information on how to set this up. If you're using a lot of GUI based apps, if you're using MATLAB, this is um, probably what you're going to want to use. And um, I would recommend checking it out via um, our docs, uh, uh, docs.nurse.gov. You can just type in no machine or you can use this um, URL here. Okay. Um, it's really important to us that you get the help that you need when you are stuck. Um, and so submitting a user ticket, um, that's what they're called, they're help tickets, that's um, how you can get help. And so our help portal is at help.nurse.gov. Um, so you can type that in, it'll redirect you or to um, ServiceNow, that's our sort of uh, platform that we use to um, track and help people with their um, tickets. You could click on open ticket right here and that will take you to a form that you'll fill out with um, your information, what's going on. And in a moment, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what to include in there, um, but there's also requests uh, forms. And so for example, if you wanna make a reservation, this is a way of saying, hey, I'm gonna be doing a lot of compute. I really need you guys to set aside a little bit of um, you know, compute for me. Um, that there's a, a form in there, so you can request that. Um, you can increase certain quotas. So for example, if you need to increase your scratch space for a little bit, um, let's say you're, you know, you're going to be running a bunch of simulations and it's going to create more than 20 terabytes of data. You can go in there and request temporarily to increase your scratch space as well. Um, there's also a place in there to ask us to help you with installing software. So if you're you need some special software and um, you don't want to try to install it yourself, um, you can ask for help doing that as well. You can also open a ticket, but um, the, the the nice thing about opening these request forms is it kind of streamlines our process on the backside. So sometimes you may even be, like I've had to do this where I've said, hey, you know, this sounds good. You know, someone submitted a ticket, but can you just go and do the form? Because it makes it easier for us to actually like complete your request. Um, so this is what I was talking about, that storage quota. So when you click on request forms, you'll see this thing that says storage quota. This is where you'll tell us, hey, you know, I need more scratch space or, um, I, I mean, I was under the impression you can't do this for CFS, but someone can correct that. Um, it, it'll give you some options here and just, just fill it out with um, your information. Or if you need help, again, you can start by submitting a ticket, asking for that help, and then going through and submitting that request form. Um, it is really important to us that you get the help you need as quickly as possible. And usually that means giving us some um, good information when you file a ticket. So just saying, hey, my thing doesn't work is very hard for us because we're going to ask you a million questions anyways. So one thing you can do is by is is actually give us more information to start with. Um, include, you know, your um, error message with some contacts like, hey, I, this is what I did. And then I got this error message. If it was a job that you're having trouble with, give us some job IDs because we can go look up what happened. Um, you can tell us the location of certain files on the system. Um, you can tell us what modules you're using. So, um, you know, when you're running something on Perlmutter, there's a bunch of modules like libraries that are working in the back background. It could help us to know which libraries are you using because um, that will let us know, hey, you know, this is the wrong version or so forth. Um, so and giving us any steps to reproduce is really helpful because if we can reproduce it, we might be able to figure out what the problem was faster. Um, you, We would say don't include screenshots. Um, this can seem helpful, but what ends up happening a lot of times is it, 
like I physically can't read the screenshot. Like it's too big, it's too small, it comes out fuzzy, something like that. And then the other thing is I can't copy and paste from that image. So what's happening is I'm having to pull up this very grainy image and then try to type what that person, what you know, what I see in the screenshot. And that's just not very helpful. Um, so instead, just give us, and it's okay to have a long ticket with a ton of information because it's easier for us to go through that information and decide what is needed and what isn't um, rather than having to like keep asking you a million questions. Um, for example, it's really hard to troubleshoot if someone says, hey, my code is slow, my job won't start, or Perlmutter is broken. Um, that's something that we really can't do much much with um, until we ask you a bunch of questions. Um, so for example, it's okay to say, hey, you know, I ran this job and then when I ran this same exact thing later, it was way slower or, you know, my job script is here. It works. Um, this won't be an issue anymore, but you, you would say like, it's, you know, it worked in the past, but now it's not working. I got this error message. Um, and, and so forth. So you can see already, it's just way more information for us to work with. And it's way more helpful for you to include an actual error message, even if it's long, uh, because we'll just have more to go off of to get you going really quick. Okay, um, that those slides are part of a longer presentation with more information. Um, and so if you uh, want more help on submitting good tickets, um, please make sure to come to those presentations sometime in the future. We'll have sessions on how to submit a good user ticket. A um, few more things. Uh, try to finish up here soon so we can get to our break. Um, we have very extensive user documentation. This is our user manual. How do you use our system? But we want to make sure you know how to use our documentation to find the, the information you need. Um, so when you go to docs.nurse.gov, we've talked about this a couple of times. Um, that's the website. Um, this is what you'll see. And please know that our documentation, we have people constantly working on this, updating it adding information. So it's very well maintained. Um, and if you are noticing something that seems out of date or wrong or anything, we are very responsive to fixing it. So please, please, please feel free to submit a ticket and say, hey, I saw this in the documentation. Is this still the case? Or, you know, it would be helpful to have this information. We're, we really like that type of interaction. Um, you can actually um, submit um, pull requests. If you, you can, um, our, our documentation is available on, on Git, GitLab, GitHub. Um, you can uh, fork it and make suggestions, changes, and then submit a pull request if you think that there is information that um, we should include. Um, and like I said, our staff are very responsive to that. So it's not like it'll sit there and be ignored or anything like that. Um, one thing to know, uh, so so just navigating this page itself, um, on the left side is the website navigation. So this is a list of all of the different um, like topics or subtopics that are available for you to navigate, um, to look at. So you can click on any of these and you can see even, so this, this is like a page by itself, but then the ones with the little arrows means that there's more information in there. So you can click on that. Um, so this is website navigation, and on this side is page navigation. So this is telling you on this page, and you can see it's sort of cut off here because there's more if you scroll down, you can use this to navigate to a specific part of the page. Um, so remember, left is website, right is page. Our search function, as I mentioned, it works. It's good, and I would highly recommend you use it. It can find stuff within... Um, you know, a page, you know, it's not just going to take you to the top of the page, it'll take you to the specific part of the page, um, because these are all like links to sub uh, subheadings. Um, highly, highly recommend if you're having trouble, feel, you know, go ahead and try the search, um, the search feature on our documentation. It's very good. Um, so you, if you want more information about our system, if you go into systems now, it doesn't have Corey, um, it will have Perlmutter and you can get more information about like, what is our system made out of, you know, what kinds of CPUs and GPUs do we have? If you're interested in that, that's a good place to go and look that up. It'll have technical spec specifications for Perlmutter. Um, you know, if you ever want to brag to your friends about the amazing supercomputer you're using, or, you know, I love telling my like gamer friends, like, yeah, I have access to like 
A100 GPUs all the time. Like I don't, you know, um, I, I love doing that. So if you ever feel like you want to brag, feel free. This is the place to go get that information. Um, Helen did mention our file systems, but we have tons and tons and tons and tons of information in our documentation about how, like, what are all of our storage systems? What's the difference between them? How do you use them? How do you access them? Um, and so I would really recommend in the beginning, if you're confused, understandably, because there's so many different options, um, just check out our, our uh, storage system information here um, and learn about what the differences are. Um, you know, snapshots, what does that mean? It means that we're backing stuff up. Um, some of them you'll see we don't back up, some of them we do. Um, or actually, sorry, snapshot and backup is different. I guess I don't know what a snapshot is either. I thought they were the same thing. Um, but for example, um, scratch space is purged. That means that after, I think it's 60 days of not being used, I think, is it 60 days? Again, someone double check, 60 or 90 maybe. Um, those might get deleted. I don't think it means that they absolutely will, but they they definitely might. Um, so if you have something that you need access to for a long period of time, Scratch is not the place to keep it. There are other places to keep it where it will be permanent. Um, so learning all these things beforehand is a really good idea so that when you get to that point and you're using these resources, um, you won't be surprised if suddenly, you know, something's not there. Um, again, we have all of our information about connecting. So things I just went through, all of that is here. Um, how do you connect those? You know, if you don't want to, you know, type things in, you can even press this little copy button here and you can just copy and paste it. Um, remember, you have to change your username here. So it's not going to work if you leave user. Um, but if you copy it and change it to your username, you can just put this right into your terminal and um, run it in order to um, start the process of SSHing into nurse uh, into pro monitor um we have tons of information on running jobs so again if this is your first time at a hpc facility the way that because it's a shared resource pro monitor is it's kind of like everyone's trying to use one one giant computer um what ends up happening is if you have some computation you need to run what you're doing is you submit a job um, to our scheduler and our scheduler will say, okay, you need, um, you know, three nodes for five hours um, and we have space to squeeze you in here, right? So it's kind of like an appointment booker. And then during your appointment, your computation will actually run. So that's what a job is. And that's what the scheduler is. Our scheduler is called Slurm. Um, and you can learn all about it. You can um, go to the documentation. But in reality, you don't necessarily need to know too much about Slurm. It's taking care of tons of information on the backside for you, so you don't have to. Um, all you need to know is that if you submit a job, um, so that means you'll have usually a script um, that will say, hey, I'm using you know, this account, um, I need this many nodes, which means this many CPUs, please run this program. Um, you'll write that into a script. Um, and again, we have tons of information here on how to prepare that. Um, so if you don't know, that's totally fine. Just go in here. And I think, again, part of our, our um, training this today and tomorrow will include that information. Um, you, you will... Um, only be able to do two of those at a time. Um, so we need to make sure that everyone's getting their jobs through. So two, two, you can submit a hundred, but two of them will kind of be ready to run at any given time. And then the next two and then the next two. So um, someone's going to go more into detail about that. But if you need help understanding any of that, our running jobs section has tons of information. Um, and yeah, again, like I said, tons of information. I'm not going to talk about this specifically because I want to just mention a couple other things, but documentation is a really good place to start. And then if you have questions about it, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, one thing now, and this, so this is not on this website anymore. Now it's actually in the documentation. Um, so if you go to docs.nurse.gov, you can type in job script generator. And so this is actually going to help you prepare that script that I was talking about. Um, I'm not sure if one of our speakers will go through this in more detail, um, but this is something definitely worth trying. And you can ask us about during office hours or in a ticket if you need help with this. Um, but this is now in our documentation. So it's interactive. You can type in your information here and it'll actually prepare the script for you in real time. 
Okay, last thing is our homepage. Um, this is not docs, this is like our nurse website. Um, this is gonna have all kinds of different information. You've probably seen this already because we've been linking you there for um, the agenda, for example, for this training. Um, but in general, if you go to events and then nurse training, you'll see this huge list of all of the various types of training we offer. And, and NUSC offers like, I think between 40 and 50 trainings a year. So if you can, if you think about it, there's at least one a, a week, if if sometimes maybe there's even more per week. Um, so usually if there's something that you wanna learn how to do that's specific to, to using NERSC, you can um, go check out our list of trainings that have happened in the past. Um, you'll find usually the slides for it, you'll find videos. Um, I would recommend not going too far in the past because a lot of these things are, you know, changing on the time scale of maybe a year or so. Um, so there might be old trainings and we're going through and, and curating and clearing some of those out of there. So if they're not relevant anymore, we just, you know, we don't want to confuse people. Um, but sometimes, you know, if there isn't an upcoming training and you need that information, we do have a huge catalog of training and videos on our, our YouTube page. So you can always go back and view some of them, even if they're not live anymore. Um, there's a calendar, highly recommend checking out the calendar. It'll give, it'll give you all of our events, our, um, community calls, our, uh, you know, for example, when our annual meeting is, um, and you should be able to add this to your calendar. So I think if you press this button, if you use Google calendar or maybe any type of calendar, you can just add it to your calendar. So you have it, um, and you don't have to, you know, you don't forget it. Um, one of the most important things, um, and sorry, I, I promise I'll stop in like two seconds, is our live status page. This is really important. Please go and bookmark this, um, add it to your bookmarks bar, keep it open, keep this um, available because one of the first things to do if you're having any trouble connecting or something's not working go here and double check that there isn't a maintenance um, or sometimes systems go down, right? We're, we have people constantly making sure our system is working, but sometimes things go wrong. And so we're very, very good about as soon as something goes wrong, changing the status here or writing something like in, engineers are investigating, like something went wrong, we're working on it. Um, you're welcome to submit a ticket if you feel like we haven't caught something. Um, again, you're always welcome to do that. But sometimes it'll save you time and us time if you go and check here and you say, oh, there's a maintenance today. That's why I can't log in. Or, um, oh, there's some something has gone wrong and, and NERSC is aware of it. So I'll just wait and see when they fixed it. Um, so, so that's a really uh, good place to check. We have our planned outages available here as well. For example, spin. So, so Jupyter Hub is hosted on spin, which is like our way of hosting like websites or um, science gateways. Um, so sometimes spin will, um, you know, there, there'll be a maintenance or um, sometimes there's like a brief little outage or something that means Jupiter hub might go down for a minute or two as well. And um, so again, always double check that um, in, in before you submit a ticket, if you're still having trouble or it doesn't look like anything's wrong, again, always submit a ticket, but this live status page is going to be your best friend when you're using NERSC. Um, my top tip is to add disruptive outages to your calendar so you can plan ahead. Um, so for a while, the quarry maintenance was, I mean, Perlmutter maintenance is like this too, but, um, you know, the, the, there are certain maintenances that we have planned very far in advance. We know the whole system is going to be down for a day, two days, something like that. Um, we try not to have disruptive outages like that very often, but I used to, when I was a grad student, add that to my calendar because then I could plan around that. So I would know, okay, this is going to be my simulation day because Corey's going to be down. When I was a grad student, Corey was the computer I was using. Um, you know, Corey's going to be down on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, I'm going to have to do other work. Like I need to, you know, that'll be my writing day or something like that. Um, so my top tip is add them to your calendar so you can plan ahead um, so that, you know, if you have something do or you have something you need to show on a group meeting on Thursday and Promoter is having a maintenance on Wednesday, make sure you do your simulations on Monday and Tuesday, things like that. Um, okay. 
And let's see. Oh, the other thing to do is please, please, please join our user Slack. Um, we have a space where users can ask questions. Um, you know, you might even interact with other users there and say, hey, I'm having the same problem. Let's work it through it together. Um, in order to access that, you need to find it in our for users section in the nurse user group section. Um, and there is a link, um, I'm not sure if it shows up in these screenshots, but it, there is a link there. You will need to sign in with your NERSC credentials in order to access the link for our user Slack, but it is there. Um, and you are more than welcome to join. A lot of us uh, staff are in there as well. We, we just double check and make sure people are getting the help they need. Um, so with that, um, having gone way over, I apologize. Um, thank you so much. And uh, welcome. And please feel free to reach out to me. I forgot to put my email, but it's my first and last name at lbl.gov. If you have any um, specific feedback or thoughts about um, connecting and, and joining NERSC.